Welcome to the 258 Studios podcast recorded at the Stewed in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Um, this week we're going to kind of deviate from what we usually talk about, which would be like entertainment and, you know, local politics to discuss something that uh, seems to to bother a lot of people and it, and it, and it really bothers me and that's and that's the the culture of uh gun violence we're we're living in right now um that we have been living in for decades um we were fortunate enough to get uh dr mike jenkins uh up here to you know talk to us about you know his experiences with law enforcement um you know kind of his his observations about, you know, what, what is going on, what, what we can attest some of it to, and also some, some proactive measures to, uh, you know, avoid a lot of these terrible tragedies in the future. Uh, I'm, I'm a person who believes in the right of the second amendment. I'm a, I'm a person who believes that, uh, you know, law abiding, safe, uh, responsible gun ownership is, is afforded to us by our forefathers. Uh, but I also think that we're at a point right now where we, we really need to look at, uh, you know, our, our, the gun society and, and, you know, mental health and, and our kind of, uh, easy access to, instruments of of nothing more than uh to kill or maim um you know people who hunt for sport people who like to shoot at gun ranges um i for one you know every now and again like to go to a gun range and you know i'm with very responsible people and i'm with people who uh safety is number one and uh, they're very good citizens, very good Americans. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I think I'm just as kind of perplexed as, uh, the rest of normal society is uh, about why this is happening, the prevalence of it and, uh, what we can do to, to reduce it. Uh, I don't think you'll ever stop gun violence, uh, in total. Um, but I think, I think you can, you can make a dent at it so that no parent or fewer parents, uh, have to plan a funeral. Uh, it, the, for some reason, Parkland bothers me, uh, in the same way that it bothered a lot of us about Newtown. And it definitely bothered me, uh, in so far as remembering Columbine, in 1999, uh, I remember seeing that happen live and I, I couldn't, you know, as a 19 year old young man, I just couldn't understand how this is happening, why this is happening. And in the years afterwards, why very little was done about preventative measures for this to happen again. Um, there are some who uh, have ideas that uh, to do nothing, and then there are some who believe that you know there's some proactive legislation that we could we could you know convince our 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 lawmakers to pass bills to uh, better kind of oversee uh, the the sale, distribution, and use of uh, guns. Um, there really is no concrete answers. There really is no concrete solutions. Um, but I think people on both sides of the argument, you know, the 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 people who are like, we should we should you know, arm more people and the people who are like, well, we should definitely arm less people. You know, I think 
as individuals, they can sit down and, and come to sort of a, a, a rational compromise. Um, but, but groups seem to not allow that to happen. Um, you know, to give a little perspective, you know, I, I, like I said, I, 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 you know, like to go to the gun range every now and again. And I was just at a, uh, NRA concert, uh, last weekend. And there was a, a lot of very, very, uh, very nice, um, family oriented, polite, uh, gun owners there who, you know, unfortunately, we have to live in a in a society where this is a this is a, this is a thing and you know if we want to ma- make america great again we can't be letting our kids uh be put in harm's way uh for special special interests or for money and 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 that's my opinion you know right wrong or indifferent so um uh, we had the pleasure of having Mike Jenkins on here. Stacy uh, couldn't be on because she had prior uh, engagements, and I just thought it was so important to get this conversation out there. And I know a lot of you will not agree with me or Mike, um, and I take zero offense to that. I'm 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 just happy that we're having the discussion. So. Uh, we are going to forego the intro and we are just going to get right into the conversation with Dr. Mike Jenkins. So we are here with uh, Dr. Michael Jenkins. Can I say that? You could say that. I could say that. A couple um, times. Dr. Michael Jenkins has an, is uh, an associate professor in sociology, criminal justice, and the criminology department. You have a BS from the University of Scranton an MA and a PhD from Rutgers. Um, You got the Fulbright Scholars Grant receipt in the spring of 2017 to work with the University College London and Metropolitan Police Department to study how police use force in the resolution of disorderly offenses. You've been quoted by and or written for um, the New York Times, the BBC, the Huffington Post, and the Washington Post. You have a book title, and I want to say this, oh, the whole okay. thing. I know you don't want me to, but... I'll take a break for a bit. Yeah, take a nap. He, you're, <laughs> you, have a, you have a book titled Police Leaders in the New Community Problem Solving Era, which explores how some of the nation's top police executives drastically change the nature of the department's relationships with the communities they serve. You have also authored Labor Unions, Management Innovation, and Organizational Change in Police Departments. And you have a book coming out this spring called Policing the World, the Practice of international and transnational policing. We get paid by the length of the title, so. Well, that's what I hear. Yeah. It's like, you know, that's why Lemony Snicket's <laughs> and a series of misfortunate events or whatever made so much money that it did. So I, we are now, what, a week away from Parkland? So you and I are sitting here on President's Day, and maybe this is a kind of a, a, a loaded question. But do you think our forefathers today would be in a good mood? I think it's a sad state of affairs when um, our children and our families aren't safe in any public place where we gather together. Uh, Schools, churches, movie theaters, malls. And um, when you look at some of the suggestions for preventing these attacks, more police in schools, metal detectors in schools, I think that that is what would make our forefathers turn in their graves. That, we, that we'd have to put that those have things. To do that, that these are the reasonable suggestions that some people are putting forward to prevent the mass killings of American citizens. Now, I just to give you some context, I'm, I'm one of those guys that's, that's like, I didn't understand what the Second Amendment was about up until a couple of years ago. And I saw this woman whose parents were gunned down in a, uh, like a box restaurant, you know, like a shenanigans. I don't know what, what it was. And she wasn't allowed in the restaurant with her gun. And she was speaking to the Texas House of Representatives. And her argument was, which is what I didn't realize, was that the Second Amendment was written 
to prevent tyranny from a government, not to protect from Pete down the street. Now, am I, am I getting that correct? That's my understanding, too. I'm, I'm by no means an expert in the Second Amendment. But yeah, you and uh, I are not constitutional lawyers. No, not by any means. <laughs> yeah. So, and that kind of changed my perspective a little bit where I was like, oh, in an upright, like, you know, a tyrannical government, you can stand up to them. And it's actually in your Bill of Rights that you can stop your government. Um, I, I think from, from when that was written to now, it has somehow gotten bastardized into people treating the constitution and the bill of rights like a poem yeah, where they get to pick and choose like what works, what doesn't work and what it meant or what it means. Yeah. I think that um, people are, are using it to justify their own interests and their own hobbies. And um, certainly I, I know that one of the justifications is that the whole purpose of the second amendment was, as you said, to prevent a tyrannical government from, uh, taking over. Um, if that is in fact the purpose of the Second Amendment, then I think that there are no weapons that we currently have on the market that would keep right. Joe Schmo on the street from being able to prevent that from occurring anyways. Right. And then so the the second reason has fallen to I have the right to keep myself, my home, my family safe. And from my perspective, um, where I am a little bit more well-versed in the research and the ideas behind... Yeah, because I'm not. That's why you're here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um uh, it, that is not the case that, um, almost all of the research that is done on gun ownership, on having a gun in one's home shows that in fact, it does not keep someone safer. And you can make individual arguments about all oh, this one time, my friend was confronted. Well, there's always, put, the, the, there's always the, the, the fictional the like, but in this circumstance, there's yeah, always exactly. an exception to the exactly. rule of that. But I would hope that we don't make these, um, policies based on, on, um, bad science, right? Or on um, policies that aren't going to keep us as a public safe. And that seems to be what most people grab to now is that I have the right to carry a gun because I have the right to protect myself. Again, when you look at the research, that, that just is not the case. Now, what does the research say? The research shows that having the presence of a gun increases the likelihood of you being a victim. We know that in the United States, compared to other industrialized countries, that our homicide rate is about five times that of other countries. We know that a lot of that um, difference is driven by a gun homicide rate that is 25 times that of other countries. 25, 25. times. So either we're more uh, deadly in terms mm -hmm. of the individual motivations of, of our fellow citizens, or we're more mentally ill than other areas, or we're just more inclined to violence than other countries. Um, if you're not going to say that the presence of guns in our society are what contribute to gun violence and gun homicide, then what is it? Well, I mean, what do you think? So I, so I, I, I there was this, there was this book, uh, a couple of years ago called Freakonomics. Do you remember it? Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, it was like chapter by chapter, like all these strange just, just statistical, I don't know why mm -hmm. the, the Queen's English escapes me for that moment, but it was, it was like cause and effect. And what we thought it was, but what it really is. Mm -hmm. And the one chapter that really got to me, whether, you know, and, and I, and, and I don't want you, I don't want you on here or me to have this stance on like, get rid of all the guns or we should get more guns. I don't think that that is mm -hmm. the question that we're having. So, so in Freakonomics, I, I didn't read the book. I watched the documentary. So in, in, uh, there's a lot of people who don't remember New York in the eighties, mm -hmm. Times Square, you know, drugs were prevalent, prostitution was prevalent, crime was prevalent. And, and the guy who wrote this book, Freakonomics went through and they were expecting the nineties to make the eighties look like kindergarten. Right. right. And for some reason crime went down. So he accounted for about 50, like 2% of like increased budgets for law enforcement, better law enforcement, more prosecutions, you know, just taking a, a stance of like, don't slap these people on the wrist. They have to be set examples so that we can have a society that isn't afraid to walk down Fifth Avenue. Mm -hmm. What he found out was, is what made up the other 48% or 50% or whatever it was. And what happened, and I don't know if most people know this, but what happened in 1972 with the Supreme Court? The legalization of, uh, 
abortion. Yes. Yeah. Roe versus Wade. Right. So all those children that were going to be born to mothers and parents that didn't want them, strangely enough, accounted for some parts of the decrease of crime in the 90s. In the midst of that, somehow guns became more prevalent in our culture. They've been, they've been, um, look, I love a good action. I love Rambo. I love watching that stuff, but that's a, that's an isolated thing. It's fictional. Plus the guys at war. <laughs> you know what I yeah, mean? Right. It's not like, it's not like he's in Cleveland going to some, yeah, going some crazy. Yeah. So in, in your estimation, like where, and we had postal post office shootings. Like it wasn't just like this mass shootings aren't new, but they are increasing. Correct. Right. And the body counts are getting higher. The prevalency is getting higher and the age is getting lower. And, you know, I had to, unfortunately I'm like this Facebook warrior who feels compelled to say stuff. Don't a lot give of, up. I won't. Um, and a lot of people seem to forget uh, the university of Texas in 1966 when crazy man, was at the clock tower just picking people off. I forget yeah. his name. Yeah. Like for the life of me, I forget his name. But That's at least okay. since 1960s, like before we went to the moon, this has been happening. Why now? In your ass, like why now is it so prevalent? I remember Col like Columbine killed me as a, as a, you know, a 19 year old young man. Like it, I remember watching that live and, you know, seeing kids falling out of second floor windows and it was crazy. And I don't know, like, why didn't the shift happen then? Yeah, yeah that seemed to be the turning point, right? It was, it was Columbine. Well, at least you thought it was. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, it seems to be the point in history that we all go back to. But like you said, even though the, these events go back much further. Um, so you've, you've said a lot and you've covered a lot of the... Sorry, uh, I was trying to do my yeah, research, so I didn't look you, stupid in front did. of you. did, yeah. So um, let's have a semester together. We could talk about this. Yeah, can I get my um, PhD? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The 1990s, you're right, are a period in which criminologists, you know, try to study what happened and, and why did crime decline so precipitously and so sustainably to this day, where we are near all time lows uh, generally in the types of street crimes that we often will measure. Um, we also had uh, Columbine at that time and, you know, specifically related to, to mass killings and a school mass killing. And one of the things that we learned from the uh, aftermath of Columbine is that, in fact, there are these copycat uh, killers. Sure. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure today. You know, we know if we, when we look at the numbers that these types of incidents are increasing. Um, I think one of the contributors to that might be, and I say this again very cautiously, might be this – uh, value that we place on on popularity, on uh, you know social networking. This this idea that you could put your work out there, mostly for positive purposes, but sometimes in very negative ways. Um, Are you talking about people who who espouse pe people who may want to do these types of things and who may want some type of notoriety for right. uh, doing something bad? I mean, is there is there some sort of you know because you study sociology, right? Right. So is there some sort of thing that we're, you know, no matter how insane it sounds to this person seems reasonable by going like, I'm a nobody. Here's how I can be somebody. Again, I think that might be some of the uh, the motive for s some of these incidents. Um, I to at least get people to pay attention to me. And that's part yeah, of, to exactly. me, that's part of the mental exactly. illness it, part of it. Sure. And if you look at this, this, uh, this latest incident, unfortunately, um, th this guy had repeatedly, repeatedly made sta statements, um, which he tied himself to. They were not, not anonymous statements. They were online and they were with his name, his accounts saying that he wanted to do this. Now, I think this is probably not very popular, but, uh, you know, he's, he was telling the world what he wants to do. I think he was probably hoping he wouldn't have to do it, right? Because he's seeking attention, seeking attention. He could have right. gotten a lot of attention um, just for having done that. Right. And as messed up as it is, the type of attention he's receiving, it would have been attention, right? And nobody, he didn't get the attention from law enforcement, from the social agencies that responded in Florida. And as a result, he went and now he's getting, you know, more attention than he probably ever imagined. In, I, I follow these things a lot and part of and, and like they happen so often that that I feel like I'm anesthetized to it you know it's kind of like 
you know, like I, I can only assume like, you know, a soldier whose who's first week in Vietnam compared to his 12th week in Vietnam, his his point of view changes dramatically and emotionally. Mm-hmm. Right. This seems to like hit me in a way that kind of like Newtown did and, and Columbine and and and. When when the, when when the students and a lot of the people kind of went, you know, you you can take your thoughts and prayers and shove them up your ass. Yeah. I I've never seen that before in a situation like this. Is there a, is there a title shift? Yeah, happening I, I, or hopefully it happening. Seems, it, in my opinion, this is hopeful that we have people who were there who were literally lying on the ground while they watched people have their pr- brains brains blown out. Right. Right. Um, they were there. They're children who are in high school. It's supposed to be a safe place, and they're coming out immediately saying, "We want change. We demand more. They deserve better." Right. We as the adults deserve. Uh, or should be giving these children more than what they've got last week. And Th- those kids are amazing. Me by it's, speaking it's unbelievable, out. and yeah. I really do hope that it will result in some real changes that will not keep this from from occurring because it, it it can occur. You know, even without any guns, without the the most secure schools you might have. But certainly, we need to focus on minimizing the likelihood that this could occur in the future. Minimizing access to these mass. Uh, killing instruments. I, I, you can't really believe everything you read on the internet. Is that right? <laughs> that's what I hear, or at least that's what I see. So I have to like triple yeah. source like so much stuff that I see. But there's there there was a poll or a statistic that I saw that even like ninety percent of all NRA members are like might want to you know look deeper into some of these see some of these people and make it like a little bit hard. Cause if you're, cause if, oh, if you're, so. if you're, that, if you're a law abiding citizen, real news, yeah. yeah, that they don't have a problem going through a background check. We do it or, all the time for different things, right? We all subject ourselves to, to aggravation, to paperwork, to bureaucracies because, you know, I just I got back from uh, traveling, going through the airport. Does anyone like having to take their shoes and belt off and go into this machine? No, but one looking? guy had a shoe bomb, yeah, so exactly. now we all do it. Exactly. And, that and didn't so explode. I would like to think that even those of us who might love our guns and love to shoot on the weekends and love to get an expertise in that area, that we'd be willing to to maybe delay our purchase of that gun one week until there's a background check. And I, and as that statistic suggested, um, that is indeed the case, right? 90% of people in the United States do believe that this is a reasonable uh, step for people to take before they get these, these weapons in their hands. Um, but part of it is the way that it's been politicized um, where we're screaming past each other and thinking that there's, there's more disagreement where in this case there's, there's, um, more agreement, right? Where we do agree about some basic reasonable measures that could be taken. So if I'm in, if I'm in a room of kindergartners and 90% of them want drawing time as a teacher, wouldn't it behoove me to say, all right, well, it seems like the majority of the class wants to do this and, and that's okay. So maybe we'll, you know, set aside some time every day to, to, to draw. If 2% of the kids in the class, well, obviously you disregard that, but when 90% of the people are like, we need to do something, why is nothing being done at all? Because I, I, I'm really hating this argument that now is not the time to talk about it. Yeah, and um, you know, back to the point about the students, the victims themselves last week stepping out and, and, and politicizing it, for, you know, for lack of a better word. Um, I'm glad they did, and and I think they give everyone else then the the authority to to politicize those the terrible acts that were, were done down there. Um, the reason why I think um, we haven't seen change is because we as individuals and voters and supporters of candidates have not demanded it, right? Um, if you look at this from a political perspective, Democrats and Republicans, uh, Democrats had control of both houses or uh, uh, the House and, and and Senate and the presidency um, not too long ago. That was this 2008 and, to like 2010, wasn't right, it? Right, right. Yeah. And, and nothing was done. Why? Because we didn't care. Did we write our Did we write our representatives? Did we demand action in these areas was that, right that are now so concerning to us? When was Gabby Giffords? Like 2011? I'm not sure the year. But I mean, so, no. so we've, we've had state reps gun shot yeah exactly at the beginning of the year yep. if i'm not mistaken not this year but 2017 wasn't like the house minority oh, the, on the baseball field right yeah 
Yeah. And still nothing's done. So it's like, even if you say like, well, that's not happening in our house, like now it is. And still nothing's getting done. Yep. Yep. Like I'm like, I'm the guy. If this makes, if this makes sense, like I've gone out shooting guns before, right. In a, in a controlled environment at a shooting range or whatever. And there's, a, you know, and trust me, the people I go with, like safety is number one, you know, like you have to have your ear protection. You have to have your safety goggles on. You know, don't be ignorant and spinning your gun around going like, that was cool, you know, because that's how accidents happen. They're very professional at how they do it. I've, I've, I've shot with Army Rangers, uh, you know, Special Forces people. I've shot with people who own gun shops. Mm-hmm. They promote safety and being responsible, gun safes, everything like that. Where is, there seems to be like this disconnect of like, South Park covered it. Like, you're not going to take our guns. They're here to take your guns. I don't think anyone has ever said we're taking guns. Right. I don't yeah. think any politician, yeah. I don't think any president, I don't think any head of state anywhere has said, you know, whether it's the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of State, no one's ever said, hey, we're, we're going to take your guns. What we want to do is make it harder to get them. And by making it harder, we're trying to be more thorough. Mm-hmm. I think that's what people are mistaking, like being harder. It's like, but I don't want to, you know, I don't want to do the tough mutter. Yeah. It's like, I just want to, I just want to get my gun. It should be hard. It's right, hard for right. me to get a license. Exactly. It's hard for me to incorporate a business. It's hard for me to, there's a lot of things that I like to get a mortgage, mm-hmm. very hard to do. But if I want to walk into Walmart, I can get a shotgun. Yeah. Probably in the amount of time it takes to develop my photos. Like, I don't understand why people don't see that as a problem. Yeah, I think that these these interests and these knee-jerk reactions to, um, you know, policy on both sides are being used by special interests to um, try to serve their own needs. And so you're right. In reality, there's agreement about what we could be doing. Uh, people who, who love guns and who own guns and want to continue to purchase and use guns um, legally and safely um, are willing to to, to um go through whatever hoops might be necessary if they believe that it will keep those guns out of the hands of people who might use them for nefarious purposes. Um, and yet, like you said, we still don't seem to be able to take action in, in some of the most basic um, improvements that we might have uh, around guns. Well, there's there's the argument made that, like, well, they'll come in illegally anyways. What's, what's the counter to that argument? Well, you know, you said we don't want to be here about, uh, we don't want to be talking about uh, taking guns away or not having guns or having lots of guns, more guns. Um, but I do think that, um, you know, from the school of thought that I come from when it, when it related to crime and offending is that um, when you have more of something for legitimate purposes, that those guns, right, that that um, we are flush with here in the United States um, will be able to find themselves in the hands of people who want to use them for bad purposes, for illegitimate purposes. And so... Um, we do have to limit the ability of a wide group of people to be able to use guns. It have you know we have a gun for every household in the United States. And um, well, if I'm not mistaken, it's, there's a gun for every man, woman, and child in the United States, which to me means there's a, about 370 million guns of different varieties, right, in the United States, right. And so Is that a, um, I read that on the yeah, internet, I, I, so I don't know if it's I, true. I, I, I believe that's about that's about correct. Okay, um, but this is a g- a good point. We don't know, right? Because we don't have right. any idea of the guns. But to your question about um, can they get in the wrong hands? Yes, we can. Which is why we do need strict control over these these weapons, right? Right. Um, and again, uh, it's something I'm, I'm fairly adamant about. It's and I'm not a very radical person, and and I think um, one of the reasons why you invited me to come talk is you because said, you see, I mean, you and I are wearing grandfather sweaters. Look at so us. Yes, the, the, exactly. You seem, you seem like really just, you know, rational exactly. and reasonable. I'm trying. I'm trying. And, and, and this is <laughs> this is one area where when you look at the literature and you look at the research around guns and gun violence. By the way, there's many more people killed every day by, you know, handguns and type of urban violence that often um, we, we forget about. But when you, when you look at th- this literature and the understanding of how guns and violence are related, um, 
the presence of guns increases the likelihood of violence. And across the board, everything a, a, you across read. Across the board. Across the board. It's it's very comparable to uh, climate science, right, When as it relates to um, global climate change. Every scientist who studies climate change says that humans are having an impact on making warmer temperatures and these, these types of drastic uh, weather events that we have. And yet there's still a large debate around whether or not, in fact, humans are contributing to global climate change. Um, it's the same around guns in my field. And I'll tell you, um, knowing people who are doing some of the best research, reading the research, being familiar with it, um, individuals, they're not doing this out of political motivations or because they have a disdain or a hate for guns. Um, they're doing the studies, they're looking at the research, and they're saying, you know what, if there's a gun present, you're more likely to be a victim of homicide. If there's a gun present, you're more likely to die from suicide, right? So if we break down gun violence into suicide, uh, homicide, homicide broken down into uh, the urban street violence, right. uh, mass killings, what we're you know primarily talking about today, and or domestic, gun injury domestic violence, right? Or never mind gun injury. Jeez, yeah, yeah. Um, the presence of a gun increases the likelihood that those things are going to occur. Period. It's not debatable. So why are we debating about it? Why are we debating the the, the science behind global climate, climate change? change? You know, it's the same exact thing. There is, um, you know, I'm, if you live I, ten miles inland and all of a sudden you have beachfront property, you can't yeah. really say. <laughs> well, and people do, and people I know, do. That's, you know? It's just um, so. I'm I'm glad that that uh, you know you force me um, to to take the opportunity and time to think about this a little bit more because it's easy, unfortunately, to see this you know this uh, a mass shooting and to say, oh, you know, this is life in America. This is what it is. Even in my field that you know I study this every day, this is what it is. Um, you know, prepping to come here with you today, I had to think about this a little bit more. And something that um, what struck me was to this point about the. Uh, the illogical debates that we have and the beliefs that people have is that this is identity politics, right? You often talk about identity politics in terms of one's gender, uh, sex, religion, race. Um, when it comes to gun ownership and one's f fetishizing guns, it's, it's identity politics. And then since then, I, I read this term, amosexuals, right? Oh. Amosexuals who okay. um, are the types that you would say um, are worried about any type of um, limit on one's access to guns is going to mean that they're getting their ammo and, and, and their guns taken away. And so I, even if even if so even if I say this month you can't buy 150 bullets, you can only buy a hundred. They look at that as you're taking my ammo away. Ammo sexuals, I think so. Okay, yeah. Th that's a term I've never heard before. Yeah. And no, I and I just read it recently. I thought it was it was pretty fitting to help to explain again the disconnect between what is out there in terms of the truth of, of the science behind gun ownership, access to guns and violence, and those who will continue to, um, to fight against any limitations on uh, background checks, on access to, to guns, uh, bullets, but without But without playing the chess game of life, they're just immediately like, they're exactly. gonna take my guns. Yeah, yeah. Instead of instead of saying like, all right, well, let's sit down. Because the, the thing that hits me is that like, I have a new nephew, right? He's he's 10 months old, totally awesome. Um, not my kid. I'm still incredibly concerned mm -hmm. about what's going to happen in 14 years. Yeah. I'm, con I'm incredibly concerned about my friend's children who are in grade school, middle school, and high school. Like, everybody who says, you know... For the love of God, thank God that it hasn't happened here yeah. yet. Yeah. And I think it's not a matter of if, but when. Without a doubt. Un unfortunately, that is the case. And so, um, you know, in, in, in talking about this this meeting between us, what did we say? If it doesn't work out this time, there'll probably be another mass shooting, right? Yeah, like there, you, there's going to be something. Yeah, what did you and I say? It was like, all right, well, if we can't make the podcast on President's After Day. After the next one, like this is. We can still, we can still have it. And, and I think I replied to you where I'm like, how sadly true is it, that? It is. And it, it's it's terrible. It's awful um, that this is the reality that we face as a country, right? Supposedly the freest country on the face of the earth, right? Um, and yet, and when it comes to these mass shooting events, um, any of us are are subjected to the potential for this violence, right? Anytime sure. that we're going to go somewhere, there's other people 
uh, we run the risk. We run the risk of, of uh, being a victim in this Even in this fractionally, way. you're still running the risk. Very fractionally, but still there's a risk. And it's not something that, you know, if you talk about, if you look at urban gun violence, it's, it's, um, it revolves around groups who are involved in the streets, involved in certain other criminal activities. And so we could keep ourselves from that type of lifestyle that puts us at risk of being shot in the street. If you look at domestic violence, right, there are certain indicators that suggest that we might be a victim ourselves. We could potentially protect ourselves from those incidents, given how difficult it might be in, in other circumstances. When it comes to these mass shootings, we are all equally likely to be victims as long as we're around other people. Uh, the school district where this last shooting occurred, the most recent one, um, I read this and I'm not sure that the. I want to see if you can confirm this. what I was going to say. The median family income. Oh, no, no, I wasn't talking about was, that. You go with that and I'll go with mine. Was, I think, $174,000 or $274,000. So it's an affluent school. Yeah, very affluent school. Um, and you saw, you know, the, the victims apparently come from different races, ethnicities. Um, apparently, again, just based on that statistic um, or based on the, the, the median household income, um, affluent area. Um, and so if it could happen there, one might think it could really happen anywhere. And, and it could, right? When you look at that, it, it has happened across the gamut of, of socioeconomic status, geography, um, social place, right? Churches, movie theaters. I li when I lived in Los Angeles, one of my friends uh, had a roommate who was a teacher in Compton. And like, oh God, that was years ago. But I remember what he told me was just so mind boggling where he said, He's like, look, I teach down in a place that nobody really gives a damn about. Mm -hmm. He goes, we have shootings almost on a daily basis and you never hear about it. That was striking to me yeah, where exactly. like a child can go to school and not come home and we're not hearing about mm -hmm. it. Yep. And I think that's where politics comes into play and, and people's ability to personalize the, the likelihood of victimization comes into play. You know, if, it ha it's, if it's happening over there, it's, it's elsewhere and it's not affecting me. There, you know, there's ideas that, oh, well, um, that's where they are and, you know, that's the risk they take. I live in this nice area where I don't have to be confronted with that reality. Well, guess what? When it comes to these mass shootings, we all have the potential to be affected well, by it. Well, I boil it down to, to you know, uh, you know, like the, you know, the, the politician or who, who, you know, or the mother or the father who is like, you know, homosexuality is an abomination and, you know, they shouldn't exist. And then it's like, Hey, by the way, your son's gay. Yeah, exactly. And then they're like, yeah. well, maybe we shouldn't abolish the, you know, maybe yeah. they're not all that bad. Yeah, exactly. So it, it, it seems like everybody, like, like if Marco Rubio's kid was in that school, He'd be singing a different tune. It'd be interesting to see him do that dance, wouldn't it? In terms of it his, would be his, yeah. um, because the re Republicans. It was the Republican uh, practice team that was shot up um, last year, right? When yeah, they, it was the Republican. Yeah, they were and the and um, they seem to be the party that is more against um, uh, gun control legislation than compared to the Democrats, and so they've been victims, right? They've yeah. been targets. Um, and so again, uh, the disconnect between one's reality and, and their ability to support their own interests. And, and they're now releasing how much money all these, all these politicians get from oh, the yeah. National Rifle mm -hmm. Association. Some of them are getting, you know, three, four, five million dollars. And if I'm not mistaken, the last number I saw was that President Trump got $30 million wow. from the National Rifle Association, but, you know, postscript read on the internet. Yeah. Um, but it's still a dramatic amount of money. And, you know, I do a lot of political campaigns and, and, you know, unfortunately like somebody gives you money, you owe them something, mm -hmm. you know? Sure. I mean, they're not spending money because they want the, the yeah, they they're not like, I want you to take tougher, away my guns, yeah, make it tougher, you know, whether it's the NRA or uh, gun manufacturers. Right. But I don't, but, but what's the end game? Like, is the end game profit? Is the end game like, like why, I just don't understand, like, what the end game is. I think if you're in a business that manufactures guns, then the, the end game for you is profit, right? It has to be. So they're, they're not trying to contribute to the greater good. They could, they could argue as much as they want that they're trying to 
allow individuals the ability to keep themselves safe, but that's just not true. That's just not how it works. What's a, what's a vehicle made for? I'm gonna be. I'm gonna. I, You're putting I'm not trying to. Here. I'm not trying to placate you, and I'm not trying to talk dumb to you. I'm trying to. I'm trying to get to a point because yeah. I've seen all this. The yes. social media warriors. Yeah. Um, what's vehicle the primary purpose of a vehicle? Is made for driving. Transportation. Transportation. What is what is a knife made for? Cutting tomatoes. In essence. Food preparation. Food preparation. What's a gun made for? Killing. That's it. Exactly. Yeah. That's there's no other thing. Okay, no, it's also it's also for hobbyists, right? For target shooting. Yep, I get that. Yeah. You I'm know, just trying to but, say. But my point is is that it's not made for like you know, art. Any and, and even if you acknowledge, which I, I do, that hobbies are important and that if one enjoys shooting guns, that's good for them. And it, it, I think it adds to their life, their ability to find enjoyment. But when it comes at the expense of 30,000 people a year in the United States alone um, being killed by guns or dying as a result of gunshots, um, that's where I think one's hobby needs to take maybe second chair to, you know, community safety, children's safety, accidental shootings, right? There's that one stat that, that um, more people are killed by toddlers than terrorists in the United States uh, because really? of accidental shootings. Yes. Oh my God. Yeah. You know, I mean, this is a real problem. And if, if we're not going to um, acknowledge the role that guns play in gun violence and, and the access, the easy access that we all have to guns, then we're, we're not going to make any headway. So, so I, I, there's going to be another shooting. I, I see arguments for, um, you know, it's estimated that 90,000 people a year die from misdiagnoses from doctors. Um, a, a massive amount of people die every year from prescription medication. Um, there's a lot of different things that are probably more like vehicular homicide did, did we just take over vehicular homicide i'm not sure or vehicular that. accidents and death with guns i'm not sure okay yeah. so like for us as for us as a society and i think that i like i like i like to play both sides i like to look at both sides right so i like to look at like the gun con the gun enthusiast and the and the people who are just like at just no guns at all mm -hmm. right and try to find a common ground in the middle is it, is it, or do we as a society get affected by this because it's so, it's so quick, it's so final, and it's so devastating? That's it, right? It, these weapons are easily concealable, they're easily transportable, and um, they, they carry with them the instantaneous death that's why we like shooting guns right because it makes you feel really powerful when you're yeah. pulling that tr trigger and feel a kick back and watch something get blown up right it's unfortunate that some people like to watch other people get blown up and that that could happen but that is in fact what what the, the case and so you could compare overall deaths if you're looking at it from the total harm that's into our society if you want to compare uh, v auto vehicle accidents or, um, like you said, misdiagnoses or medication, but each of those has some positive that we all agree is worthwhile in our society. Right. And so the unintended negative consequences we're willing to, um, deal overlook, with. overlook, but yeah. still make steps to try to mitigate and, right. and minimize them. Right. When it comes to guns, again, the value is that individuals, like the hobby of of owning a gun they like the the feeling of security again even though it doesn't necessarily make them feel safer but at some point those values need to take a second seat to the value of life right that we value the ability of children to go to school and be safe that we value the ability of 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 people going to church and worshiping to be safe and if that's not who we are as a country then i don't know you know what we are well, if we're not protecting, you know, our children and, you know, in church goers. Yeah. I mean, I mean, freedom of religion, you're allowed yeah. to go, you know, worship whoever you want, as long as it hurts nobody. Yeah. You know, why, why can't you do that without wondering, without worrying about, you know, some young kid. And it's a lot of, a lot of these people are young kids. The uh, killers. Yeah. It's not no, like a 70 no. year old. I mean, minus the guy in Vegas, but that seems yeah. all the information from that seems really sketchy. 
I agree. It's highly suspect what's going, what what happened there. And what transpired yeah. since. Without and having read up on it recently or having followed any of the uh, potential theories behind what's going on, it's it's been suspect. Yeah. The fact that there's no known um, motivation for his his uh, Yeah, and actions. one photo. And, yeah. and, 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 and interestingly enough, the day of the shooting, they released the autopsy reports from Vegas. Oh, wow. And I didn't realize, I mean, everyone was making the argument like this guy was so far away with an AR-15 that, you know, we're surprised he did damage, right? But what they found out is that most of the bullets didn't enter straight. Mm. So in the air, air resistance happened and they just started spinning, which actually creates more damage Mm. when it happens. Just rips up. Yeah, rips people to shreds. And by the way, we, we haven't talked about the psychological damage. That, well, I want to. I want to experience. I want to. I want to. Yeah, I want to get into that because it's like you survive. Now what? Yeah, exactly. Are you really a sur- survivor if you're living with having watched someone get their their heads blown off? I know someone who uh, said that uh, they knew someone who was at at the uh, Las Vegas shooting and watched someone behind him get his head blown off. So this person who was there and survived isn't in the the tally of victims. But could you imagine what his experience is going to be there for the rest of his life? Having yeah, every time he closes that, his eyes. Having seen that. Um, and so the damage is so much greater than the, the physical harms that are done to people in these, these situations. And it, it's, um, again, we're, we're talking about mass killings, but 30,000 people a year are, are, are um, dead as a result of guns. And those 30,000... Come with all of their family members, witnesses, individuals. And there's who, not just thirty thousand victims. Yeah, exactly. It just exactly. it just expands out more and more. And when th- there are steps that can be taken in terms of limiting access to guns that that will reduce the likelihood of these incidents, um, it's really sad that we're not taking action. It's, it's sad that we've not, as individuals, supported candidates or mandated that or you know. Um, told candidates that they should support certain types of legislation. We've allowed them, you know, I'm a big proponent of if we get what we deserve when it comes to our politicians, right? We are to blame if they're not doing things we think they should be doing, because in the end we do have all the power, right? We have the power to support, to elect, especially the platforms that people have, like you said with Facebook, I think that's powerful. Yeah. Well, look at the, the whole, you know, Russian investigation stuff where they're saying Russia used Facebook to change people's minds about things. We we're to blame for that. We're to blame to, to be uh, persuaded. Yeah, and in that and in that and in that story, like I'm the guy who's like, you know, I'm not like the biggest fan of Trump. Um, we don't even need to go there. Yeah, right? but 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 what I but but he and I and but I think he's emblematic of 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 a lot of people who run for office. Like I'm sure you and I have both talked to people who are like, I'm thinking about running, and their first response is, "Are you nuts?" Yeah, yeah. Because it's like only crazy people run for office. Like, we care about you. That should be enough. I was, you don't I was just watching to... Jerry Seinfeld, by the way. Did you see his latest stand-up? No, I did I not. Think. Is that the one that went he back says, his the years? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I didn't see that and yet. He, he was talking about, you know, some people are saying that our current president is nuts. But he said, I think anybody who runs for president is obviously nuts. He sure. Said, That's the, the, the test. Sure. If you say, I think I should be president someday, then you're saying I'm nuts. Yeah, you're like, come here, step into this yeah. room and answer this test. Let me tell you something. This test. I'm crazy. Um, um, the... Some of them are not exactly the sharpest tools in the shed, and you know, with with they say with great power comes great responsibility, but the actuality of it with with, with great power becomes a hunger for more power. That's right. Or if nothing else, a hunger to to keep your to job to keep it to keep, keep to keep it. Position. Now there's there's in my estimation there's a systemic breakdown of of people in the house and people in the Senate. And that goes on the federal level, the state level where, you know, the moment you're in office, like, I don't know if most of most people listening to this realize that like the democratic party and the Republican party have their own offices separate from the United States Congress from, from, from Capitol Hill Mm -hmm. that they have to go and make phone calls to donors for half their day Mm -hmm. to raise money. So they're spending at least half of their time when they should be legislating at begging for money so that they can get reelected. I think that's a problem. Sure. I think another problem is, is that they're not edu- like to me, 
I th- the reason why I think Columbine affected so many people is because we watched the aftermath of it live. Sure. Yes. And for a lot of them since, we have not seen that. You know, when you talk about like West Virginia, mm-hmm. um, Newtown, Parkland, uh, Parkland just really bothered me because we live in the social media age and a lot of those kids were Facebook mm-hmm. living. Mm-hmm. And to hear the horror and the terror and the fear and, we should and the gunshots. Today. Yeah, we should have to see that. I we think should, we should have to. Politicians should have to see that. Yeah, Again, sit in a room here, watch these 48 minutes of children hunkered down in a classroom. And the other thing I know is, is that that school did active shooter drills. Mm-hmm. That school was as best prepared as they could be for that situation. And a lot of, and I don't, I also don't think that people realize is that down in Florida, you know, you're, you're, the buildings are separate. Right. It's a campus. It's a campus. Yeah, yeah. So what the kid did was he pulled the fire alarm. Everybody came out for the fire drill and then he, he, he just started, you know, so no matter how many precautions you can take, there's still a way around it. There's no fail safe, foolproof way to do it. What do you think about? my assessment of it's 10% gun control, 70% mental health and uh, 20% safety. Those are your numbers broken down. I just, I just did it this morning. <clears throat> you can uh, tell me I'm full of shit. Like that's okay too. You're the, you're the, <laughs> you're the doctor. No. Uh, again, I don't claim any special expertise in this area. Um, but I would place a much greater emphasis on guns. You just simply so and I just no matter th- how mentally ill someone is, no matter how motivated someone is to do that level of mass killing, they just it, it cannot as easily be done but for access to the types of guns that have been used in, in these incidents. It's all been the same, right? It's all been the same weapon of choice in these mass incidents. Well the um, and the interesting thing is 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 a lot of them are are Caucasian. You talk about, yeah, uh, masculinity and issues of, of violence and, mm-hmm. domest- you know, previous domestic violence incidents. Sure. Yeah, these are in, important indicators of someone who um, needs to have uh, limited access to guns, right? It's not hard. And, and, and I, I heard that this, again, this latest incident, um, and I keep saying that because it's unfortunate that, you know, we have to demarcate which incident we're talking about. And again, there'll be more in the future. Um this this person, the, the cops were at his house multiple times, right? And, yeah, the and FBI actually, I believe, came out and said, we FBI dropped the ball. Radar. So, um, and that's understandable in terms of probably the, the amount of, of tips that they get. And um, I'm not saying it's excusable, but it's, it's understandable. There's only 16,000 uh, FBI agents, um, and they're doing a lot of other things for our country. Um, but yeah, if, if you have someone who's been a, a known repeat offender who has access to guns, who has said that he wants to do this, that might be someone you want to take a look at. Um, but to your breakdown, you know, your, your 1070, was it 1070, 20? 1070, 20. Yeah, with 70 being mental health. Mental, yeah, I, I think that um, this is See, where. But, but, but when I say that, what I should have done is prefaced it with the fact that, like, 10% gun control being like, let's implement the things that make it more difficult to get them 70 percent is is you know 100 years ago hospitals and mental hospitals were yeah. separate yeah. entities mm-hmm. where you can treat people look we're not all einstein you know there are some people out there who have serious psychological mm-hmm. problems that need to be dealt with that need to be addressed and hopefully they can get to a point where where they can be active members of society or or and, be and not inst- have access to guns and not have access to weapons. Um, we don't do that anymore. We just stick crazy people in jail. And here's the thing: um, you're right. That is the unfortunate shift in uh, policy over the last, I'd say, fifty or sixty years in terms of deinstitutionalization. Yeah, like the guy who ate the other guy's face should be in a mental hospital. Yeah. yeah. Um, and also should not have access to, to guns, a weapon, right? So he shouldn't have weapon. He shouldn't have access to a spork, let alone a gun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, we know that, you know, as much as people say, oh, well, if they don't have access to a gun, then they'll find some other way. Again, 
in most cases, that's not the case, right? Just generally speaking, it is not the case that they were improvised in ways that result in the same level of casualty as someone having access to a semi-automatic assault rifle. Um, and so I come from the school of thought of, 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 again, limiting one's ability to access the means to, to do this type of deadly behavior. Um, so that no matter how mentally ill the person might be, no matter how motivated they might be, if they don't have something that is as easily concealable and um, transportable and then um, deadly, then they're not going to be able to do the damage that they're motivated to do. Well, people are 3D printing weapons now. Yeah. But again, I mean, Isn't that, I mean, that's crazy. Yeah. And, and if we ever get to the point of actually limiting access, then that would be something that would have to be considered. Right. Dis- dispel or explain to me this. One of the arguments is is that automatic weapons are illegal. Is is that true? In in what way? Like like you're not allowed to sell an automatic weapon. Well, the weapons that have been used have been semi-automatic. Okay, right? so how been, do they, so how do they get from automatic to semi? They being who? It's just the so, weapon. Oh, I'm not sure exactly. I mean, because because difference. from my understanding, like when you have like the gun shows and stuff like yeah. that, oh, here's yeah. this aftermarket part that you right, can buy exactly. for $15. Yeah. Here's this. Exactly. You know, the bump stock. Right. Um, which should never be out there. Yeah, I mean, those are good examples of places where I think most people would agree. Um, people should not be able to purchase those aftermarket add-ons to make their machine a little bit more deadly. Yeah, right. you're, yeah you're, 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 your gun isn't a Supra. Like you don't need to like, you don't need like to put yeah. new rims on it unless like the only people that I see do that are like crazy, like Gaddafi, you know, where he needs a gold plated yeah. yeah. M16 or something like that. Like, why do you, why do we need to augment these weapons to increase the capacity, whether by larger magazines or faster rounds per minute? Like it's already doing what it's supposed to do. Why do we need to? You know, like I never understood the flamethrower guy who's like, I really don't feel like standing up. I want to shoot fire 40 yards that way. It's easier. But, th- it? but, th- but that's but that's what I'm saying. Like, it's they easier don't, he to doesn't do only have to use his own energy to do that. But how do you just like we're sitting down here? I, 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 chat, I, right? I don't understand the justification of like it's for hunting. Uh, I agree. I mean, it's something that is completely um, out of my realm of being able to understand When it comes, especially when it comes to, again, a comparison that um, I may want my access for my own individual legitimate purposes, but doing so means that other maniacs who want to do massive amounts of harm will also have access. And so at some point, I would hope that we as a country would come together and say, I'm willing to take, I'm willing to, you know, put my interests aside to minimize my interest a bit if it means that people will not be able to purchase, you know, walk into Walmart and, and purchase this mass killing machine in a matter of five minutes. And easily, in, 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 it doesn't take any expertise to learn how to use, right? No. <laughs> like, well, why, I, I don't understand, I don't understand, and maybe you can help me, is that, like, you 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 you, you deal, um, I don't know if it's on a daily basis, but uh, very often with law enforcement, d- different aspects of law enforcement, like how many can you explain to me how many different you know whether it's you know from the local police level to like how far does how far does your interaction with law enforcement go sure it's been primarily local police um a little bit with the pennsylvania state police um but police all over the world and um i think you're hinting at a a good point in, in the united states that is that um i would think that police officers on the street would feel a little bit safer if they knew that the people that they were encountering were going to have very limited access to guns, right? Um, such as the case in London, where I study. The police there just could not even imagine what it would be like to police in the United States, where they know that in a lot of cities, when they're when they're stopping people or when they're arresting people, they're going to have access to these, you know, even just firearms. I mean, is that what they? Is that like like? You don't have to name anybody or, or say anything, but do you get the sentiment from these law enforcement officers saying like, 
we need to do something about this. But without a doubt, in the, in the UK, officers were just shocked, you know, generally overwhelmingly shocked that the, the, the gun culture in the United States and thinking about what that means for um, policing on the streets in the United States. Um, in, the, in, in the US, uh, police, you know, I'm not sure of the breakdown. It's certainly not as strong in terms of their... Um, fear around people being armed it's I, I, because it's just so part of the job right, um, right. in terms of what they're doing um, but i know that there have been a lot of police leaders who have come out and said we want stricter gun control because our people on the streets our officers on the streets are in danger and they're seeing how even if they're in a city or in a state that does have stricter controls that that guns are coming across borders because it's only a matter of sometimes a few minutes across state borders where you could buy guns. And I think Pennsylvania and New Jersey are a good, a good example of two states that border each other and that have differing um, restrictions on the, on the use, carrying, and purchase of guns. Um, so the, the strict laws in New Jersey are completely overridden by the more lax laws in Pennsylvania. Because you can interstate go buy guns. Well, you can, and if nothing else, it's very easy to put in your car and drive across the border. You know, is that so? So why isn't why isn't why isn't law enforcement kind of you know pulling the bullhorn to their face and saying, "Look, we don't want them." Yeah, exactly. Like, we don't like we don't want to we don't want to serve a search warrant or something, and somebody in there has an arsenal. You know, so in a weird way, by protecting our police officers, we can probably protect our kids. I think that's that would be a great group to step up and to to fight for. As as I as I mentioned before, they have. There's been been pockets of this, but on a more national and in um, in a more um, systematic way, being inter- an, an interest group that steps up and says we want stricter gun control. We want limits on access to guns because it's going to keep us. Safer. safer. And it's going to make us feel better about the ability to do the jobs, right? Because most cops aren't going to admit to fear. But, yeah, and most uh, cops also don't want to kick the door down and start mowing people no, over. No, without a doubt. Right. Without a doubt. Um, but having knowledge of, of the access to weapons that people currently have is going to change the way that police do their jobs. Now, I was at a, uh, strangely enough, I was at the NRA country show in Harrisburg. Sounds like a great time. Two weeks ago. Wow. Um, one of my friends was playing. He's a country singer. It is what it is. Um, but, you know, I like his music, one-on-one. All those people are good people. Oh, sure. They're good. Yeah. Yep. Like, they're good, fun, sense of humor people. This one thing, like, you, you don't talk religion, politics, and now guns mm-hmm. is on that list. Mm-hmm. And I think it's an absolute shame that we should we should shy away from having the gun discussion because I did it. I don't know if you read my post. I did a post on Facebook where mm-hmm. I'm like, look, there's if now's not a good time, when exactly? Because there's yeah. no good time to talk no. about it. We no. have to talk about it. We have to talk about mental illness, and we have to talk about our politicians doing nothing. Mm-hmm. They are not mutually exclusive ideas. Right. They all go together. We need to talk to. We can act on all fronts. We can act on all fronts. Capable and be proactive. Like I can't. I like it. Still, it still bothers me that that like you know, almost two dozen kids get killed in Newtown. Like young kids, like in third and fourth grade. Nothing gets done. Yeah. Nothing gets done. And it's and something that I didn't realize, which really flabbergasted me, was this uh, Nicholas Cruz. It's the largest mass shooting in U.S. history where they actually got the guy where without killing blows, him. Yeah, kill him or blow him his head off right. himself. Which could be a really interesting study in the future to understand this culture. But, but the CDC is not allowed to investigate and analyze gun culture statistics, what it, what it does for the, for the national security of our country. Um, And that's actually a really interesting history of how that occurred about, about 20, uh, 22 years ago, I think it was 1996. um, They were accused of politicizing um, research around guns. And of course, 
they were they were coming out with research that was critical, uh, or not really critical, but um, the findings people concluded were critical of gun ownership. Essentially, saying all the stuff that you know we've talked about before, where having guns increases crime, increases the likelihood of violence, and um, as a result of that perception that that was um, unfairly critical of gun manufacturers and the NRA. Um, it, the was CDC. it unfairly critical? No, exactly. I mean, that's a judgment call, right? I mean, <laughs> the, the conclusion is that it's critical. That's it's a subjective it's opinion. Yeah. Um, but as a result of that, um, the CDC was told that you, they cannot take, they cannot um, take activist stances or they can't, they can't serve as, as activists for uh, any types of certain uh, of, uh, policies. Um, Re- regarding guns? Especially because of the the gun incident, right? So how? But how can? But how can they take? Your, I'll, I'll use your word, an active position against Ebola. Well, I th- well, that, exactly, right? And so <laughs> I'm just this, asking. No, just... this was around around the, the gun research that was done, um, and as re- so, they were they were told about essentially, you can't take these stances, um, and then their their budget was cut the same amount that they had to use the previous year for gun research. Uh, the harms that are done by guns. And so, um, you know, that's, essentially that's, sending that's, a message that that's, you stop this. That's insane. Yeah. yeah. Um, because at the end of the day, what harm? Like, what harm does the research do? Well, the truth, it, first of all, it helps us get at the truth, right? Which is, and the truth is, looks very bad for guns, which is why, again, I keep coming back to it's gun stupid because, um, unfortunately, and again, as we've talked about, um, I'm, this is one area that the science is pretty well settled. And when the science is settled against you as a gun manufacturer, as people who want more guns in our society, then you're going to think you're going to take that on as being critical, right? How many more effing guns do we need? How many more people do we need to be, have their heads blown off by these guns? Or maimed. Or act. Yeah. Or maimed. We're like the rest of your life. Like I remember that one kid from Columbine who was wheelchair ridden for the rest of his life. Yep. And he would go out and advocate, and it's like we miss. And has anyone ever done the work to see if Columbine is a good example? Uh, 20 years later, what are these kids up to? You know, these kids who witnessed things firsthand, who maybe had to go back to school, who, who lost their own friends. How, what kind of psychological effects have that had on, has that had on them? I can't it even fathom ability? it. Yeah. Did they, were they not able to do well in college? Were they not able to get a job and focus on, you know, 40-hour work week, whatever it might be? Who knows? And I would I would well, can they have a family? Are they alcoholics? Exactly. Are they, you know, some of them, and some of them might be like, you know, I, I've met people who have been through the worst trials of their life who are who are stand up sure really good sure. people and i look at them in awe going like through all that adversity through yeah. all that trauma how are you at where you're at mm-hmm. and you know i can't worry about things i can't do anything about yeah. that's what they say they're amazing that's amazing it's actually it's actually amazing just yeah. to see somebody who can do that but then you know on the follow-up you go you never think about it oh yeah. no i have nightmares about it yeah yeah you know that never leaves you your psyche it never it's ptsd mm-hmm. so okay where, where do we go? What happens? Like, how? I don't. I. I don't. I don't. I don't see taking the number down to zero. I think no, that's I an agree. absolute I impossibility. Yeah, I agree. And that's the case in in any problem that we try to confront as a country. Right. Right. We're not going to have a hundred percent graduation rate in high school. We're not going to have. A hundred percent infant, or uh, you know, we're not going to have zero people dying in during infant childbirth, mortality, infant yeah. mortality, or whatever it might be. Um, but we need to take steps that could lessen the likelihood that n- bad things occur. And so I think that um, I'm hopeful. Again, I keep saying that that this group down in Florida, the victims who are s- stepping up for themselves, and um, being reasonable about what needs to be done in terms of uh, gun legislation, I'm hoping that they will be able to affect us nationwide in terms of people who support those causes, who demand that our politicians support those causes. Um, I, I, I'm hopeful that's a tipping point. And I think that's how things change, right? That's how, There's an event, people rally around it, we start to be confronted, we see images, we, you know, if you saw the, the Snapchat of the uh, the incident last week where where kids are screaming, I saw a gun couple fly, gun, gunshots. You know, um, that's horrific. And yeah, any normal human being 
should want to do something to stop that from occurring. I mean, that's third world, like, you know, Coney shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? Exactly. It's, like, it's it, like we're going to raid the village. For at least a little bit, right? That movement. Yeah. And, yeah. It, and it died down because, you know, the guy who started it was a lunatic yeah. and ended up naked in the streets of San Diego. So he lost all relevance for his cause. But, I mean, we're basically living in that that world where we're like we're held hostage without mm-hmm. being trapped in the room. Sure. Yeah, exactly. And I think that we need to realize that that's where we're at and that's that that is the extent of the problem and that we need to take the appropriate action to to again lessen the likelihood that that will occur. <clears throat> so being being a doctor who studies human behavior um as a I, society I say that. as a society. Okay. Like you kind of watch how like the flocks move. That's is that sociology? That's sociology, yeah. But uh, I'm trained in criminal justice, so the the systemic uh, aspect of how like what does this all mean? Yeah. yeah. What 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 do you say? What do you see that are like in your estimation? And you know, part of me is like, get rid of guns altogether, and the other part of me is like, but you know, I understand the idea of like going out and hunt. Like, I don't believe in killing animals, but like, I get it. If that's your thing, yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're not out there, you know, shooting me. <laughs> um, I don't believe in the overpopulation thing. Um, you know, when the Bill of Rights was written, it, it took you a, like a minute and a half to load a bullet. And now we're firing off 50, 60 a, a minute. So what... I'm okay going all back to muskets too, but what 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 proactive well, that would like that, would, that would solve our gun problem muskets our gun violence problem yes it would yeah or what Chris there, Rock there'd says there'd be a lag effect there'd be a lag effect with right. all the guns that we do have right but uh, yeah that's a that's that's a good in, start in, in if we your, have to start somewhere murky if in your perfect world what what do you think because because you're never gonna you're, you're never gonna get rid of guns right Why I don't not? think that's you're ever gonna get world. rid of guns Why not That's my perfect world. Well, how do we? F- does the army have? No, you're right. I think the military police should should have firearms, right, and should have the necessary equipment to do what they have to do, right. But in terms of private ownership, I think that should be severely limited. Yeah, because I had an argument with a vet, right, and the and the vet was like uh, not a, a a doggy doctor, but an actual vet who was in Iraq and Afghanistan, and you know it it it. it he it was a Facebook thing where he came at me kind of he, he didn't come at me. He actually posed like a question where it was like, um, and how do you foresee that happening? Right. And I and I wrote down, you know, I said, I said, look, if they pack, if they pass, you know, a mental health exam, if they go through however many hours gun safety, if they have veritable proof that they have a gun locker, if if they, you know, pass a, a a physical test, you know, go out and shoot, you know, here's, you know, how they do where like Dottie's being held hostage. And then over here is just the bad guy. Like if you don't kill any innocents, you know, you pass the test. There's a lot of, there's a lot of businesses around here that actually do these. Yeah. One of them that I can yeah. think of is roll call where they teach responsible mm-hmm. gun ownership and, and how to fire a gun responsibly. Um, and after I wrote all this stuff, he went, well, I kind of agree with that. So even like the hard and like military people are like, you know, I kind of agree with that because it's not maybe, maybe, maybe the way through the front door is actually through the back door by saying we have to protect our law enforcement better. Does that, and then in turn, that might be the thing that like makes it easier for, I mean, we've, we have 18 schools and there's, they're throwing this number around saying it's bullshit. Yeah. We've had 18 school shootings. Eight of them had fatalities. Yeah, that's where the misconception is. Okay, so eight is that okay? Is that acceptable to us? No, no, no. Yeah, so my know, so exactly, so my are... argument to him was, you know, instead of eighteen by Valentine's Day of twenty nineteen, yeah. maybe we have one. Yeah, exactly. Is it yeah. better? Yes. Is it is it where it should be? No. And what is the harm to our society in doing that? None. Exactly. None. You have, to, th- you have to go to a class. You have to get licensed. You People get will spend 12 hours okay. on the well, phone. How much with, do you like having your guns? Do it. People will spend 12 hours on the phone with Verizon arguing no, over exactly. their phone bill. You're right. 
<laughs> but they won't take the yeah. time to be like, no, and they will. That's the thing. They will. They need to. Like and, we need to do that. Yeah, without a doubt. Okay, so what do you think? I, I was I was having all these opinions. So what do you like in in your in your perfect world? Well, I just told you that the, no yeah, guns, no guns, but that's not going to happen. And so the, the measures that you mentioned, and, and there are some examples across the country of individual states, although that's very limited what an individual state can do in terms of its effectiveness, even if it's a good policy. Um, but the, the second issue, I do hear those people who say um, there's there's issues of uh, mental health or people just feeling, you know, hopelessness. And I think those are important, too. But again, from a policy perspective, how do you set a policy to help someone who feels hopeless? So I do think there's something in, when, it, when it comes to, uh, you know, young kids and young, young adults. Um, and again, this is just more of a speaking to those individuals who um, who will point to these these mass uh, killings and, and to the, the, the killers themselves and say, hey, they were reaching out for something. You know, be that friend to someone. Um, you never know. Help them get that, you know, help them access the help that they need. Um, well, we got to stop fun. We got to stop cutting funding to stuff like exactly. that. Exactly. And so what's that? Uh, higher taxes? Is that what you're suggesting? No, I'm not yeah. suggesting higher taxes. I'm saying I'm saying we, uh, you know, our military is bigger than, you know, 17 times bigger than the next one. Yeah. You know, could we get rid of a destroyer and, you know, put it towards, you know, mental health and, and you know, making sure that people are well-rounded and if they're, if they're lacking some sort of social you know, societal norms that, you know, we should be expecting, you know, if they're, if little Bobby's, you know, standing in the street corner, you know, holding dead cats, like, okay, we need to talk to Bobby about what's going on and, and address that. Like this kid was addressed and nothing happened. Yeah, exactly. And so, um, in that, cause I don't think we have the resources to do it right now. Like you said, it's, to it's the a matter, that it's I a matter it's of priorities. Done. It's a right. matter of priorities and prioritizing and thinking about reflecting on our values. And, and I think mental health is a good area in terms of it'll have, uh, it'll improve our society as a whole separate from any impact it may have on the um, reduction of the likelihood of, of killings, um, which again is its own benefit. And so I, certainly I think that um, better coordination among healthcare services, including mental health, better funding of public health so that individuals who are most in need of mental health and can't afford it could have good services, not just kind of check the box routine, sit down, tell me how you're feeling today, walk out type of, ser of services. Um, I'd imagine that the, the the guy down in Florida that that was the type of experience he had, right? He he was in these different systems and was confronted with these people, but they saw it as paperwork and not as the human work that needed to be done on that individual. Um, and so, certainly from a policy perspective, you know, as you're suggesting, um, we could increase the ability of people to access quality mental health care services. Uh, I think they know. I think I think people I I I think people who know that they're in a weird place know that you know if they wanted to they could they know something's wrong. No, and I think that's I said before about this guy in Florida that um again I I know this is uh, this is a very soft way of putting it that was a cry for help, right? He was telling people what, what he, was he was going, going to, to do. do. And I think in some w weird psychological way he was begging someone to, to come help me, right? And this is not to at all excuse or anything in terms of what he did. But I think that to the point of the health, mental health care services that, that one could receive and, or the, the family social services or the police that responded to his house. Again, I had, had heard somewhere 30 times 30, or so 30 times in like a um, year. He was failed. And as a result, those children who were killed and affected by that, that, uh, killing spree, um, were failed. Um, and I think that's a good point where, we as a society could start to look at the real needs of, of our fellow citizens in terms of their health care, including mental health. Is there hope for us? Of course. Yeah, I wouldn't be here talking to you. If, I mean, is that pie in the sky lofty like, no. yay? Or, or do, you, do, you see a, do you see a pathway to change where, yeah. where we can, like I said, we're never going to stop this. And, and, and one more thing that pisses me off is that 
at, at my NRA country thing where I met a lot of great people. Yeah, I like met a lot of great sometime. people. I got to meet Low Cash. Didn't know who they were at the time. Really nice guys. Love Star Wars. Um, before the concert started, you get like a three minute Wayne LaPierre. You know, welcome. Do you know what stops it? Do you know what stops a bad guy with a gun? A good guy with a gun. Well, tell there that, was a good guy tell with that a to gun. The officers' families who have been killed. What better guys with guns do we have than police? And it happens. It happens. And, there, and the and the and the guy down there. The uh, did you see the stories about the teacher who put himself in? Yeah. The athlete. The 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 coach. From what I understand, he was he was capable of, you know holding a firearm, protecting those kids. He just didn't have, yeah. a, it was yeah. just too fast it, and everything couldn't happen and fast enough. You know, he was trained. They had the active shooter mm-hmm. drills. They knew exactly what to do. And you still lose what? 17 kids. Yep. It's a, it's a effing shame. All right. Well, you had to drop that, didn't you? Right at the end. I didn't say the <laughs> full word. I didn't say the full word. It's deserving. This, this is a very, you know, this is a crisis. Again, gun crime generally, not just these mass killings, is something that we really need to take on as a country. And um, there are steps for. There are ways to improve it. And while we're not going to, going to keep um, shootings from ever occurring or people, uh, we're not going to limit it to zero. We could certainly do better than we're currently doing. I agree with you 110%. <laughs> so let's do it. That's not a real word. Um, thank you for being here and make sure that you look out for policing the world, the practice of international and transnational policing this spring. Do you have there a date yet? They told me March. <laughs> so <laughs> Gotta love distributors. Any day now, yeah. All right. Well, Mike, thanks for being here, buddy. Thank you.